Hey, this is Andy Revkin. 41 years into my uh, reporting journey on climate, disasters, biodiversity, sustainability writ large, uh, coming to you from uh, Wabanaki Territory in Maine, uh, also called Lemoyne, and um, doing a discussion today, recorded this time, with uh, a couple of folks from Global Fishing Watch and from Greenpeace, who whose focus is this uh, this largely un, still unappreciated part of the planet, which is the biggest part of the planet, the oceans, and what the human journey in this uh, Anthropocene era, whether or not you make it a capital A on that, a formal geological thing or not, it's an era of dominant human influence, human influence on the planet. And, and the oceans are some, the changes in the oceans are sometimes hard to grasp. I, I sailed, um, Two thirds of the way around the world when I was a young a young man in my early twenties, hitchhiking like I got a it's hard, long story, but I was in the middle of the Indian Ocean for we we it was a twenty one day crossing of just the western side of the Indian Ocean from Maldives to the Red Sea and and when you're in the middle of that expanse or as this picture from the uh, Midway Atoll in the uh, Pacific show, it all seems boundless uh, and of course many of the changes are chemical CO two is changing the atmosphere in the oceans. But there's also infrastructure and fishing and resource extraction. So this, and one of my, I was very excited when I was at the New York Times, when I saw Google and others had developed a um, tool called Global Fishing Watch using data that were already there initially from fishing vessels, a little transponder, a little pinger saying, I am here for almost all commercial vessels of any any significant size have to have this. And and using computation, uh, the early style of artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, to look for suspicious behavior, or just not just like when ships were in the in fishing illegally, but when you'd see one heading to Peru and another one meeting it halfway and presumably offloading fish. So I wrote about that in the New York Times back in 2015 or 16. And that's that was fantastic. But now there's these uh, iterations using data uh, and and machine intelligence to take things further. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Global Fishing Watch um, is the prime force behind a new paper in the journal Nature that just came out. Uh, satellite mapping reveals extensive industrial activity at sea, the industrialization of the oceans. And as as we all know, you know, oil rigs and oil drilling and I've been out there for, for forever and industrial scale fishing for more than half a century is built into an extraordinary force. Commercial whaling was a devastating global force. And, but we're gonna walk through like what makes this different now and what these data show and where do we go from here? And I'd like to, uh, again, I have uh, folks on, on here from uh, John Hokvar. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You can fix it in a second from Greenpeace. And Fernando Paolo and David Kritzma from Global Fishing Watch. If you can, guys can unmute, we can walk through sort of the basics of where this came from and then talk about the, the where do we go from here? Because one thing that was illustrated in the paper in a big way was big gaps. Like the, 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 we'll talk about that in a second. What are the gaps and how can we fill them? So maybe we'll start with David. Um, you've been at this uh, quite a while, trying to using the tools of that Google and other big companies and yep. have put together. And so just tell us what we're looking at here and, and how the paper came about. So what, what we're looking at here is the North Sea. And we're looking at all the activity from fishing vessels, from non-fishing vessels, from oil platforms. We're seeing wind turbines, um, everything that's happening over a five-year period. Actually, some of that's a one-year period, but anyway. But but just to take a step back on how we got here, yeah, I think... Um, you know, I got into um, this field, um, you know, with Global Fishing Watch in the ocean. I was more of a generalist in the um, environmental monitoring um, using big data. And and the reason, one reason I got into the ocean is because it was unmapped. And there was in the sense that you could make a big difference by mapping it, by processing this data. Um, and all of this stuff we're doing in the ocean, we've done similar things on land much sooner. Right. And so the ocean is kind of this like last frontier of mapping and understanding, which is which is funny because it's like most of the planet, you know, uh, 
And and so and, you know the the analogy we we always use is you you go online, you go to Google Maps, and you click on satellite view, and you just see like detailed roads. You see you can see every building, right? You can pan around and you count every building if you want to in Google image right. in, in, in free imagery. And as soon as you pan over the ocean, it's just this pixelated nothingness. Um, and so that's we can change that now. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. And and some of it's very simple stuff like just done at scale and the scale is hard in part and there's tons of difficult problems we then encounter as we do it but essentially we are just you know counting where all the boats are and mapping them and then where all the structures are and mapping them um and it turns out that's incredibly useful because you can't manage things when you don't have information about what's happening um Absolutely. and uh and okay, I may... by the way i'm just gonna here's yeah. the live this is the the live version of google uh, of uh, global fishing watch uh and it's just so it's really interesting because yeah. you have layers here for the marine protected areas and and you can see th this looks like good news i'm just briefly let's just divert into you know the existing tool it looks like maldives is doing a good job of yeah keeping it so th this is the, the crazy thing about this too is if you think a decade ago no one knew where any of the fishing was happening like this you see this all this and what you're looking at here most of that stuff and and then i think we'll get so first well, where we got to here and then i think we can fernando can talk about the um the, yeah. the new stuff we reviewed um like you know a decade ago no one pretty much knew where any fishing was happening and then the boats started broadcasting their positions on this thing called the automatic identification system or ais right. and suddenly their positions are public and we could um um you know, Global Fishing Watch, that's the thing you're talking about. We are able to take these GPS positions, put them in a huge database, run some machine learning over them, and say which ones are fishing boats and when they're fishing, and bam, we have this map of tens of thousands of boats all over the world, the first ever global map of fishing activity. Extremely exciting, extremely useful for exactly, for instance, what you just showed there. If you go back to that area, you can see like, okay, so you see like that area down there um, that is uh, south of the yeah, Maldives and, um, yeah. Um, that there is very little fishing and that's because there's some type of management regime where your foreign vessels aren't allowed there and we can track those boats and we can say those boats are allowed to fish in the high seas outside of that area right so that right. that thing what what is that by the way that if you click on that what does it say the um the green green area this area no down below sorry the oh just, oh just... I, I believe that's all maldives but hold on yeah no, that's the British. Yeah, okay, right. That's the British Indian Ocean Territory. Oh, I um, see. Yeah, yeah. North of it is the Maldives. Oh, no, Chagos uh, Archipelago. Yeah, yeah. That's the Chagos. That's right. Sorry. Right, 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 right. So, um, and so we can we can track those boats outside and say, hey, they're following the rules. That's great. Right. Um, the problem is, not all large boats broadcast their GPS positions. Right. And this is something we've known. We had no idea how many and where they were. Right. So, so let's go forward now into um, beyond fishing, this idea of um, other sources of data and other dynamics that can um, illuminate both use and, you know, legitimate and illegitimate use of this amazing thing called the ocean. Um, so here we are back to um, the slides. Uh, maybe, uh, hold on a second. And I can, I can, um, I can edit this. I just, I lost track of, oh yeah, Fernando. I was going to call you Paolo. <laughs> For, Fernando, Paolo can, you, will be can you tell us about the iterations here? You know, like what's gone into this paper and, and what's, what's trackable now that's creating this new set of insights? Yes. Yeah, so as David mentioned, right, we knew we had an idea that we were missing a big, chunk of activity in the ocean by only tracking this activity using uh, the automatic identification system, AIS. So we, need, we needed to find another technology then to map out this activity at sea. So we started developing a detection approach based on satellite imagery, right? So now we can image from space vessels and structures in the ocean, regardless if they are broadcasting or not. So in this study, we... Uh, develop an approach to detect vessels using uh, radar imagery, and, and that is synthetic aperture radar technology. 
And radar imagery has an advantage over the more traditional optical imagery. You can think of optical imagery as the, the photos that you take with your cell phone. They are very intuitive, but radar uh, does not rely on sunlight, so we can image at night. Radar penetrates clouds, so even if it is cloudy, you can still image the ocean, right? So what you're seeing here, the first figure was uh, just a snapshot of how crowded some areas of the oceans are. This is something that we discovered with this study. That's in the, the North Sea in particular. So you have yeah. uh, examples of every kind of activity going on in there, right? From fishing to transport, oil tankers transporting oil, shipping container, you know, traveling through through shipping lanes. And you have a lot of offshore uh, infrastructure development. So you have a lot of oil, you have a lot of uh, wind farms being developed and associated to those structures, the vessels that support, you know, the development and and and, and, and maintenance of those structures. So this is, is like a gist of the overall industrialization of the North Sea. And then on the following slides, then we can decompose this map into the different layers of information or the different kinds of activities. So right. this one, uh, is showing you um, the dots or the clusters are where the oil platforms are in the North Sea. And the lines that connect to all these clusters are the vessels that support those oil structures. They're being, you know, that can be from, from maintenance to actually tankers taking and moving oil in and out of those oil platforms. So in a sense, this shows you the footprint of offshore oil development beyond the fixed infrastructure. The next slide will be uh, this, this, a similar picture, but now for, for wind, uh, offshore yeah. wind. Development. So now we have the several wind farms that uh, we know of in the North Sea with their associated uh, vessel traffic. You're, it's, it's quite obvious right away, right? There is a, a difference in, in, in the amount of, of vessel traffic around these two types of activities, oil versus wind. And we find this to be a common pattern also in other areas where we have both oil development and wind development together. And then in the following uh, slide, there's yet another layer of information. This is all the fishing vessel detections that we had during, that we detected during five years in the North Sea. And, and you can see there are some very interesting patterns, right? Because fishing, you no, know, the, the fishers, they follow the fish and, and they follow bathymetric contours, like, like channels, like uh, uh, seabed canyons or ocean banks. So you see that these are not, you know, this is not a random pattern. They're clusters and they follow, you know, the continental shelf break. So very clear patterns of fishing. And some of these patterns are actually characteristic, characteristic signature of some types of fishing, like bottom trolling that, you know, later on you will see some pictures uh, uh, showing that, that very striking pattern of that kind mm. of fishing. And then the final <clears throat> layer, this is the, the non-fishing <coughs> vessel activity. And here you can see the major uh, shipping routes, right? Where, where these big shipping containers, ship container uh, uh, travel or big tankers, you know, transport oil. So this is a, a way of seeing this, this mapping of industrialization in the ocean by the different layers of uh, the different industrial activities. And so how many data sets, so this is, satellite include, including radar there are other interesting i'm just thinking about thinking open-mindedly about things like um the plumes the contra not contrails the equivalent of contrails for ships have become an interesting issue with um in terms of their impact on climate the um, cloudiness in the tracks of ships um are there any other indirect measures that that can be incorporated here uh, for these various activities that haven't been yet you know, I think I think the one um, well, the answer is yes. Um, I think that's also something we're looking at the optical imagery. So this is the interesting thing about this is this is kind of the first layer of several that we're going to be bringing in over the next few years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another another is bringing in optical imagery from Sentinel um, two, um, where we can detect vessels in a very similar way to this. It's limited by cloudiness, but when it's not cloudy, you see things very well. And in fact, we've seen in that. Um, examples of trawling where vessels are scraping the seabed and you can actually see behind them the plume of that. So that is possible. Right, right, right. Um, and it's it's pretty exciting to see that because it shows how much information is yet out there for us to kind of glean that no yeah. one has pulled together. 
so the paper does focus on these gaps and or um, sort of known unknowns. <laughs> and here's an illustration of some of that. Uh, it, it sounds like the satellite imagery can start to give you the capacity to fill in gaps. And I assume a lot of what the machine intelligence is doing is sort of integrating across those data sets. That's correct. So <clears throat> this is like is, is a good example of that. So there are two other things uh, happen here besides the detection of objects at sea, right? So once we have those objects detected uh, worldwide, now we need to identify, you know, for the vessels that we detected, what kind of vessels they are, whether they are, you know, a fishing vessel or a non-fishing vessel, mostly transport and energy related vessel. So all that is done with uh, machine learning models, right? We have designed some of these machine learning models to classify these detections. Then the all the things that we do, then we take all the identified fishing vessels in the ocean, and we have an algorithm that correlates that information with existing AIS data. So now we can separate the fishing vessels that we detected that were broadcasting AIS from those that were not broadcasting the AIS during this five-year period of time. So this figure you are seeing in yellow, all the detections that actually match to AIS that you know were broadcasting AI, their, their positions and identities, and you see it's mostly around European waters. And then in purple are the detections that did not match to AIS. So mostly that is the new activity that our mapping is revealing. And if you only used AIS as we did in the past, you would only see the activity around European waters, and you will yeah. have almost nothing. You know, in this case, in Northern Africa, for example. Right. Well, that's a super important uh, gap filling project. It, it looked like Northern Africa was just a large marine protected area, <laughs> which is obviously not wow. the case. Well, uh, this we, gets, sorry, this gets us to Greenpeace and to the conservation issues that are illuminated here. Uh, John, you, you know, just give a quick description of your background and and then when you look at this data and how that relates to your mission. Sure. I'm John Hosevar. I'm the Oceans Campaign Director for Greenpeace USA. Uh, I've been leading our work, uh, our marine conservation work, for the past 20 years. And my academic background is in marine biology with emphasis on coral reef conservation. I've um, been a big fan of Global Fishing Watch since the beginning. Really important contribution. And this paper really drives home once again just how extensive, how comprehensive our impact has been on the oceans. And it's fascinating when you look over history, most of, like for, for almost all of human existence, we just assumed that the oceans were too big to fail. And yeah. that no matter what we did, the oceans were going to be fine. Um, and there was this idea of freedom of the seas, which was kind of the philosophy saying that we shouldn't regulate what's happening on the oceans because it is free for everyone. And unfortunately, we've we've really come to realize just how misguided that was. And we've done enormous damage. And we've, we've radically transformed marine ecosystems all over the world. And we've gone from, you know, fishing in small boats to feed our relatively small communities uh, to fishing with ocean liners and we're fishing you know over a mile deep and we're fishing in the arctic in the antarctic in the middle of the ocean uh, using gear to find the fish designs with you know military technology so it, it's almost as if we've been waging a, a war on fish for for centuries and and in more recent years we've we've really been winning unfortunately uh, so this this really reinforces the need for a more precautionary approach for a more ecosystem-based approach. We can't just pretend that we can manage fisheries one species at a time. We really do need to establish a, a network of large-scale sanctuaries. And you could see in the map how stark the difference is when you have a, a protected area versus where you don't. And, uh, and it really forces us, I think, to think differently about new threats like deep sea mining. Um, for sure. We, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, so much of the 
challenges that that you talk about in your work, Andy, and that we work with on here at Greenpeace are are things that we've been doing to the planet for decades or centuries. And it can be a little bit overwhelming to think about how to solve climate change or deforestation or or overfishing. We're, we're trying to make them less bad. We're, we're trying to mitigate these impacts. Deep sea mining is a truly terrible idea that um, th it's an industry that doesn't exist yet. And so this really drives home for me the need to not add a whole other layer of destructive impact to an ocean that's uh, already reeling from what we've been doing. Yeah. In, in your mind, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, David and, and Fernando this too, how much harder is it to convey the good news part of the story? Like that, that area around the Maldives reminds me so much of the reporting I did on um, Amazon rainforest deforestation, where similar data sets showed that the Shingu, the protected areas, uh, areas protected by indigenous communities, didn't have this these walls of fire that you see, you see elsewhere. But it's hard, you know, it's easy to sort of say, point out the, the tough stuff, but uh, ho I'm hoping personally that this kind of work can attract us, including the media, to the good news. Where are the, where are the outliers like Maldives uh, that for whatever reason is showing this really interesting pattern? Um, yeah, it's an important question. Uh, and it is, it has been very encouraging to see governments start to get on board with this idea that we need to set aside parts of the ocean to allow them to recover, to protect biodiversity, and to give them a fighting chance to survive the impacts of climate change, of ocean acidification, of plastic pollution. And yeah. one of the best developments was early last year when uh, the UN agreed to a new global ocean treaty, which for the first time gives us a mandate and the tools to create a network of protected areas in the high seas. Right. And, um, it's really exciting. So now we need to make sure that enters into force as quickly as possible. We're shooting for hmm. in the middle of next year and we want it to be put to work right away. We're working on proposals that we hope will have enough support that we can fast track them at the very first meeting of the parties after the treaty goes into force. Well, I'd love to do another session on, uh, at that time. Um, so, so David and Fernando, um, just reflecting briefly, and then we'll get through the rest of the slides. Um, to, to me, is certainly, certainly on climate, the ability to independently verify things using remote sensing or other means has helped to accelerate policy. Um, an example of this was the run-up to the Paris Agreement. China revised its coal uh, use uh, upward, and it was largely seen as reflecting the fact that it's harder to hide your coal-fired power plants and the like because of remote sensing and better data availability. Do you feel that Global Fishing Watch and tools like it and what you've done with this new paper um, plays, is that part of why you do the work? Or you know, what do you see as uh, how this fits? Yes, <laughs> that is it. Uh, I, I just wanna echo what, what John said about um, the kind of, uh, you know, the ocean is too big to fail. There's also been this historical romance with the ocean. Like, like it's like thing you can, if there's no laws, right. And you imagine sailing yeah. off into the ocean and doing whatever you want. Uh, and that was great when there weren't that many of us. And it's kind of a similar environmental story everywhere. You think about like the West of the U S it got developed and then we had to regulate better because otherwise we're going to ruin it. And that's essentially where we are with the ocean, except for the data isn't there and that's what we're trying to provide. And so I think that with that data, you can exactly, like you said, like the China example is a good one of once you can see it's there, suddenly, you know, you can do it better. And that's the whole idea behind Global Fishing Watch. Transparency can help us manage this shared resource because the ocean is also very different from the land. Like you were talking about the Amazon rainforest, like that part of the Amazon rainforest belongs to Brazil or it belongs to Peru. It's under right. a specific jurisdiction. Who owns those areas that right. they want to do that deep sea mining in? It's everyone, right? And then right. the water and the fish are moving freely. And so right. somewhere where transparency is even that much more important. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's yeah. exactly, exactly it. And Fernando, we're, we're back to the, uh, this reality of these gaps. Um, as you were saying, you know, you can fill some of them using 
other data sets um, and other monitoring. Uh, but these are really big gaps. 75% of global industrial fishing vessels are not publicly tracked. Um, that's quite a number. And uh, let's see, 25% of transport and energy vessels are not publicly tracked. That's a pretty high number for something like transporting fossil fuels or, or the ships maintaining uh, turbines and the like. Where do we go with that? Uh, what is this partially, do we need to press nations to to re toughen requirements for maritime uh, shipping? Or is it, you, you, are you still gonna have to rely on these kind of proxy means? Yes, those, as you point out, are big numbers, right? So we were very surprised, you know, in finding out some of these, like the 75% more or less of, of number of casting uh, industrial fishing activity. So we actually had to convince ourselves, right? So we redid this analysis several times mm -hmm. To, we knew we were missing a big chunk, but we had no idea it was so much. Uh, the, for the transport and energy related vessels, it's also significant. It's a lot less, right? Like about a quarter of them. Now, there are reasons why a lot of this activity is missing from public you know, monitoring systems. First of all, it's important to highlight that this doesn't mean that the vessels are doing anything illegal, right? There is a fraction mm -hmm. of certainly industrial fishing out there that they are shutting off their AIS to engage in some illicit activities. But that's just a fraction of the dark activity that we map. All the reasons why you know, we don't have that activity being public is that many vessels of a smaller size, in particular in, uh, when we talk about industrial fishing vessels, they're simply not required to broadcast AIS, to carry an AIS device. And that varies from legislation by leg legislation, right? Vessels smaller than 15, yeah. Uh, meters in some places, smaller than 19 meters in other places. So that's another reason why they are missing from public tracking systems. Yet another reason, and this is more pertinent to uh, the transport and energy vessels, is the uh, poor satellite receptions. There are areas around the world that, uh, for example, they are very crowded with too many vessels or a lot of traffic, and the satellite AIS they have uh, difficulty picking up and allocating individual signals to individual vessels. So in, the, in that particular case, those vessels are actually broadcasting their locations. It's just that this global satellite network of uh, AIS satellites you know, cannot register those signals very well. So this is another reason why they are missing from uh, public tracking systems. That's interesting. So, so all that combined is what make these very big gaps, right? Now, on your question more on you know raising public awareness right uh, this is i would say our ultimate goal uh, with this study and within <laughs> global watch is making this information filling in these gaps first of all making this information publicly available to anyone and and with that hoping that we convince you know for example nations to open up their private data because many nations actually have a a good handle on uh, fishing activity and other industrial activities within their own waters. And they use uh, private uh, tracking systems, like for example, the VMS instead of AIS, which is you know, publicly accessible. But those data sets or that information is not shared with any other nation. So this is one of the, 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 the goals of this study, convincing uh, everybody that making this public is to the benefit of all. Well, yeah, especially if you want to maintain some management possibility for your resources, it would seem, and you th you think it's worth that, that data can help uh, an independent entity accomplish that goal. It sure makes a lot of sense. Um, um, sorry. If I may add on Fernando's point there on the infrastructure, just like governments, it's kind of shocking that there is no public data set of where oil platforms and wind turbines are. I mean, they're, they're just like sitting there in the ocean, right? Governments know where those are locally, local authorities, but this is the first public map of it that exists. Oh, that's so and, interesting. And, and yeah, exactly, right? Like people ask like, why do you need to do this? Because because it's not public and governments should be sharing that information um, yeah. because it matters, especially as it gets more crowded, right? This yeah. is one reason we're looking at all this other information. If you care about fishing, if you only care about fishing, you still need to map all of the offshore energy, all of the oil, all of the all of the transport, because you have to figure out how that's interacting with fishing activity. And we see that. Oh boy! So well, in Maine, in Maine, this has become an issue. You know, of, uh, the oil industry. I mean, the offshore wind industry, um, and uh, the lobstermen here and other fishermen are at war. And then there are these layers of politics around 
right, right is it what's killing right whales and how much of it could be from developing wind and boy that and actually that must create a bit of a tangle for uh, environmental groups john i i know even within the environmental community at least as it relates to right whales and lobster and 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 wind and um these other factors up here not everyone's fully aligned sometimes i don't know if that's an interesting part of what's happening as the oceans are becoming industrialized it's true it, it definitely creates more uh opportunity or need for trade-offs than than there used to be and you know you, you mentioned uh politics when you <laughs> talked about wind and and uh lobster and and those trade-offs i i think that's the main focus there really the main lens to think about it through um scientifically you know the things that are killing whales today all the evidence points to those continuing being the things that are killing whales we've got whales yeah. regularly being entangled in fishing gear uh we've got whales increasingly choking on plastic debris and sometimes yeah. it kills them or sometimes it just makes them more vulnerable and and we continue to see whales struck by ships and there are more ships than ever uh, yeah. and they're moving faster and th those are all major factors and then you throw in climate change and it's changing whales migration patterns and feeding areas and uh, often putting them in areas where they're at greater jeopardy there's so far still no data whatsoever to point at wind farms or wind development as a cause of all this mortality but that hasn't stopped a lot of people from claiming that it's there yeah and just the you know this there are some other sort of regional um projects that i think are pretty interesting uh, several years ago i don't think i wrote about it but i learned about oh it was a documentary by a friend uh showing how a monitoring of whale mo whale um uh, movements along the west coast by very busy ports uh, they were able to start doing kind of a warning maps uh, for um, shipping and you know these are big long beach santa barbara very busy shipping corridors um, so there too i think you're seeing more and more potential for um, mixing these data sets and getting reality out, out of the uh, as a result and um on this, we should note that this is actually using the Global Fishing Watch backend data processing. So oh, Whale interesting. Safe, Whale Safe is actually one of run by one of our research partners, um, right. who That's was the original cool. research partners who helped us publish on the AIS data, um, and now is using that for shipping. And we have another research project using exactly this data. And this is how we're expanding, you know, to 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 do that. Two two things I think are very interesting. One is so John, both you talked about the politics and the exciting that that unless you have data at the table and you can talk and you have a shared view of reality, everyone just comes in with their kind of preconceived notions of the world and they argue over that and you can't get anywhere. As soon as you can say, well, actually, this is how much traffic is created by the wind turbines. Right. Here's where it goes. This is where the fishing is. You can then advance those conversations. And we've seen that happen in the creation of other marine protected areas around the world, um, where there was a conflict between the fishing industry and the government. We came in with our data around where the actual fishing was happening, and suddenly you have these breakthroughs. And so that's one of the exciting things. The other thing that I think is interesting about the the whales from a kind of you know bigger picture thing is the biggest risk to whales used to be whaling. Right. And right. now, now it's entanglements, it's ship strikes and um noise and these other things that john talked about um, right. and right. and that kind of represents what we're seeing in the ocean overall that fishing is still the biggest direct impact you know but all this other stuff is increasing and and that's what we saw in our paper too that that the relative importance of fishing is declining even though it's still the biggest direct impact Interesting. the relative and so you have to think about that you have to say okay what is the impact of this noise where are these ships colliding with whales uh, and do that research? Yeah. How, how does this relate to hotspot analysis for those areas of the world that are outside of economic zones that where there isn't a, a Navy patrolling um, um, in, in, in kind of in shortish time scales, weeks over a month, can you start to develop the capacity to say, 
and we we were we were talking about this because I'm going to do a separate show on it on krill harvests in Antarctica and whale are, are increasingly intersecting with whales and it, are there these frontier spots or can you have a like a heat map of spots of concern that can drive things forward? I think the work that Global Fishing Watch does definitely helps provide the means to create the maps. And then what we hear often is, well, but you know, how are you going to enforce regulations out there? And I think another thing that the data helps show is that in any given area, when you're talking about more than 200 miles offshore, there are very few countries that we really need to be thinking about in terms of That's actually enforcing regulations. Yeah. So uh, they're usually larger ships, and there are only a few flags that are you know, going to be responsible for these vessels. So for example, two years ago, we were doing some work in a biodiversity hotspot about 250 miles off the coast of Argentina. And there's essentially no regulation there whatsoever. And there were on our radar at one point over 300 fishing vessels operating in this place. It's just, I mean, you know, not the, the epicenter of the middle of nowhere, but it's pretty far from anything. And they were they had traveled from China, from Taiwan, from Korea, some from Europe uh, to exploit this lack of regulation. And that's that's a fixable problem. I think is this is this the one you're talking about? Yes. The key ecosystem. Exactly. Well, that's great. And that's where, you know, uh, activism matters. I, I wrote about Sea Shepherd years ago during the whale wars, uh, uh, the peak of that moment with Japan. And, and my judgment was, you know, as long as there's no one else out there, um, it's hard for me to see uh, a counter argument to Sea Shepherd doing what they were doing. You, you could argue about some of the tactics, but um, so this there's a role for conservation groups uh, that are that are extra governmental outside of government to and especially in dealing with these areas that are offshore it seems like on um on john's point i think in addition to being um so one of the ways to regulate it is just to mandate people to broadcast their gps positions mm -hmm. and that you can use this imagery to see where people are not doing that right so the the imagery we've been using isn't a substitute for this tracking, but it tells you where we need to increase it. Right. Um, the other interesting thing about that is that that the ocean, it turns out, um, you know, fishing and industrial activity is actually concentrated in space and time. And so if you can know where to look, you don't actually need to boil the whole ocean, right? You can only, right. And, right. and like that example John gave it, that's a specific place where fishing is highly, highly intensified so we can focus our efforts there same way we we can look at places in where deep sea mining might be happening it's not everywhere but we right. just need to know where it is great uh, let's see if there's a and you were you're you're able to do temporal uh, uh studies too like that your paper also included the reality that you've seen uh, downturns and changes and uh, the pandemic has changed everything and it, it was visible in this uh these data sets, I guess. Uh, you want to talk about that briefly, Fernando? Of course, this uh, is another aspect of, of the mapping, right? So the, the temporal evolution of some of these activities. But what we are seeing here are uh, time series of number, average number of vessels on the water. The, the top time series is for fishing vessels, the bottom time, time series for transport and energy related vessels. So this is, this is an average. And you see large cycles there that are related to holidays, like in the case of fishing, you know, Chinese moratorium on, on fishing, uh, the New Year's, our New, new Year's, uh, and that kind of stuff. So then the number of fishings, the, the vessels in general in the water reduced, and then it goes up again. Now, one thing that we found then is for the period during the, the pandemic, uh, in 2021 to the end of 2022, where this analysis, you know, uh, comprehend, we saw that there was a significant drop in the mean number of fishing boats in the ocean. And, and I just highlighted that with that uh, red uh, line. Mm -hmm. Globally, it's about 12% decrease in the number of fishing vessels uh, on the water. Uh, by contrast, if we looked at the transport and energy vessel related, you know, they almost didn't suffer that much of an impact during the pandemic, but more than that, right? From the beginning of our study in 2017 to the end of it, 2022, 
it seems like it has been a slight increase overall in this kind of activity. And we were wondering in the case of fishing, you know, if at some point recover to pre-pandemic levels. So we actually internally did some more analysis because we have uh, more current data. And it seems that uh, until the end of 2023, fishing still hasn't recovered to the pre-pandemic level. So that's a very interesting finding. And as we say in the paper, we may have already seen peak fishing, right? That may have been in the last decade. Right. That's so interesting too. That trend is not destiny. Yeah, it's true. And of course, and then I'm, I'm assuming uh, aquaculture and other uh, sources of fish can are all interplaying there as well. And if and there's a whole another story and series of webcasts to do on the future of aquaculture, uh, some of which is in the is is floating up here in Maine. There was a Norwegian company that tried several years ago to put in floating pens for. Um, salmon propagation but to do it right off of arcadia national park and that didn't go very well so, but that you know, you know so they'll all get sort of intermixed um let me just go through here oh sorry i was just going to add another yeah. reason why the temporal data is so important um you know to take krill as an example we often hear from the industry look there's so much krill like our fishing is not affecting the overall population status of krill. And that really isn't the point, uh, especially for something that is food for almost everything else. You know, without krill, you lose the whales and many of the fish and the penguins and everything. Uh, and the ecosystem fails, basically. So it's not just how much krill you're taking overall, it's how much you're taking in a particular place at a particular time. Is there right. food available for the populations that are there trying to survive. I'm showing a little clip here of a video related to this other paper I'm gonna do a webcast on. Um, this was a Lindblad ship happened to be in place when you had this industrial scale krill fishing and an unbelievable uh, um, grouping of fin whales. It, to me, it looks like, you know, a battle scene. It, those are spouts of fin whales, the second largest whale on the planet. Uh, and, it's absolutely a battle. It's who has the right to this krill. Like, is it the, the whales or, or is it this handful of fishing companies? It, it, it's, it, it's also worth noting that when you quote, when you fish quote sustainably, right, it's just maximum sustainable yield of what you're trying to get out, uh, yeah. which is the maximum food you can produce out of an ecosystem, the biomass of fish is cut by more than half. Okay. So, yeah. So if we're, if we're harvesting krill sustainably here, there's half as much, less than half as much krill as there used to be. That's right. Yeah. The strategy is to just intentionally remove 60% of the target and, population. And there is a way often to fix fish is something called maximum economic yield, which mm -hmm. is you fish less hard. You catch almost the same amount of fish, but the biomass is much, much higher. And you end up making more money because you're not, you're not using that many boats to catch the fish. Wow. And that's one of the reasons it's exciting to see that decline in in fishing activity that we see globally, because that's what should happen. Um, that's what we want right. to see. Uh, there's just the, too much capacity in the fishing fleet. Yeah, and there's been some really good reporting on that in recent years. Um, a lot of that's subsidized, uh, theoretically for jobs, jobs, but it's so uh, so clear that it's just not productive in so many ways. Uh, and this 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 is just another piece of video of the the, the productivity the the great productivity and the the idea of fin whales after a century of being depleted through active industrial whaling now being kind of nudged out of the way uh, seems pretty uh, horrific to me. But that's for another day. Um, this is a great it, this has been a really great discussion. Uh, if you have any last points to make, I'd like to have you have. The, the floor for those too. Um, hold on one second. Just getting back to the uh, uh, one. I, I, I guess I, you kind of articulated it this, each of you, but what does success look like? Maybe a last sort of thumbnail from each of you on where this can go. Um, and maybe, you know, does the law of the sea matter? <laughs> we, the United States is like, it's just dropped off. The, it used to be at least a talking point that was asked of every presidential candidate, and, and virtually every every one of them said yes. We need to ratify the 
the uh, this treaty, uh, and then this tiny cluster of, of senators says no, and it doesn't happen. So, so just your what's your vision of what success might look like in a decade or two for the oceans and and humanity and the Anthropocene? Maybe we'll start with uh, Fernando. Yes, I would like to say that in terms of you know, mapping uh, the human use of the ocean, this is just the start, this study, right? So we are expanding, as of right now, all this mapping activity to potentially all human activity at sea and covering as much of the ocean as possible. This is actually part of a larger project uh, uh, led by Global Fishing Watch called the Open Ocean Project. So success, to me, looks like having this very comprehensive open data platform about all human activities at sea that is public and free and accessible by anyone with an internet connection. Mm. And we hope to, you know, we will be working on this for the next five years. So in this, within time frame, I, I, I hope to have these widely available. And as I mentioned before, you know, I think one of our main goals is to convince, you know, nations that are currently not sharing, you know, information on, on industrial activities in their own waters to open up that information and share that with the rest of the world. That is beneficial to all. That sounds great. And I'm, I'm happy to amplify and do more on this particular project too. It just seems to make sure people understand this is an open frontier with lots of improvement if there's more data and and more analysis going forward and then more communication of the findings in ways that matter to uh, and can change uh, the future. That's great. Um, uh, and uh, the, David and John. I'll, I'll follow up on Fernando um, yeah. and, and say that uh, I totally, in the short run, yes, that is absolutely, that's what we need. And, and, and it would be fantastic to share broadly this platform because one thing we want in the short run is feedback, right? We want to know where we're missing data. Uh, we make all of our stuff available. So there's very technical users out there that we hope will take this, download it um, and play with it and find where we're wrong and we can improve things. Um, so that's the short run is exactly. In the long run, you know, it is, a sustainably managed ocean. It is more wind turbines, fewer oil platforms. We manage shipping so that it's good for whales, and we manage ocean noise. That we're fishing at, we're not, you know, overfishing. Fishing is reduced. Biomass increases. I mean, that's that's the vision. Flourishing ocean. There you go. And John, that sounds like it probably overlaps a large, uh, largely with your vision too, at Greenpeace. Yeah, healthy oceans that. Uh, you know, the industry that we do have in the ocean doesn't exploit people. I and mean, we have enormous problems still with human rights and labor abuses on fishing vessels in particular. Yeah. And that, again, is, is connected to the lack of data, the lack of transparency. Ultimately, we need a robust network of fully protected and strongly protected sanctuaries. The world's governments have agreed to protecting 30 percent by 2030 that's now possible with the global ocean treaty but it's still going to take a lot of work and commitment we need to get rid of a lot of the plastic that we are producing we can't continue to make trillions of plastic items a year much of which ends up in the ocean uh, and expect things to work um, we need to ban deep sea mining before it starts and we need to think a lot harder about what we allow. We have to stop, we have to basically flip things around. Um, instead of requiring enormous amounts of data and maybe a decade of campaigning before we decide an area is special enough to be worthy of protection, we have to start thinking about the ocean mm -hmm. as vital to our survival and flip it around. If someone is going to do new exploitation of the ocean they have to demonstrate that they can do that in a way that's going to work yeah that's that's i, I did a session on seabed mining and and that i personally have a emerging i still have an open mind on the possibility of some exploitation of these resources so but you have to have data and understanding of the impacts and where there might be uh, places that are more appropriate or not um that's just me um, but, it, but I did a session on it, and the key here always, as we said, whether it was with lobstering and 
and whales and, and offshore wind is having some, as David said, some kind of a, a little bit of a baseline of reality that everyone can start to agree on. And I do think that it gets more doable with these open data sets for sure. That we've seen that, as we said, with China, um, you see it all the time. And sometimes it can generate its own momentum. In the United States, decades and decades ago, in the 80s, I wrote, wrote on the toxics release inventory, which was uh, basically a requirement to do an inventory of your uh, pollutant emissions. And it generated change without a regulatory hammer. Once there was a culture of just knowing what your factory was doing, it started to move in a certain direction. In the early 90s, there was something called PROSPER in Indonesia, P-R-O-S-P-R. That was similar. They, they started to realize, wow, if we just know what's, what's happening, people, the, it's easier to make the case for doing better. So this is a great, it's been a great show, um, great discussion of this paper in nature. A lot lies behind this, this technical paper. Satellite mapping reveals extensive industrial activity at sea. As we said, I love the Open Ocean Project and uh, greatly appreciate the work Greenpeace has been doing to uh, foster better outcomes, too. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, I encourage people, once they see this, to share it with others as a way to propagate better outcomes for the planet. This is Andy Revkin, sustain my Sustain What Enterprise. You can subscribe through the information in that the scrolling bar at the bottom. Hold on a second.